really uh, want to just say thank you, thank you uh, on behalf of my colleagues at IJM for the chance to be a part of what uh, is your ongoing exploration of uh, what it looks like to seek justice uh, for the neighbors in our own backyard and and around this around this world. That is our our mission on Earth to love God and love our neighbor, and we're excited to be a part of uh, what you guys are exploring. Uh, it, I need. I realized the last uh, session. I need to fly because I'm from the South, <laughs> and I talk really slowly. Um, so I'm going to try to pick up the pace a bit. A um, couple of things I want you to do, or just a couple of questions I want you to have in your mind as you th- as you reflect on this passage as we move forward uh, in the message today. In that Isaiah 58 passage, do you hear more condemnation or invitation? Do you hear more threat or more promise? So just hold that um, as we move ahead. As you may know, in India, which is where I got my start with IJM, there are literally millions of human beings, human beings, uh, trapped and enslaved for labor or sex and violent brick kilns, rice mills, uh, flower farms, brothels, and the like. And in India, as in most of the uh, developing world, the problem is uh, not a lack of laws. In these places where actually everyday violence just persists against the poor, the problem is not laws. The laws in India are strong enough, just like here, The laws promise that if you try to own another person, the government will show up with all the coercive power of law enforcement to stop and restrain you. But in India, as in other parts of the developing world, those with the power and the legal duty to deliver on those promises uh, too often fail to show up. And so what this means if you're poor in these uh, uh, hard areas of the world like India is that you're not just hungry or lack medicine or clean water, what it means is that you are utterly unsafe from violence. Now, when I usually speak about our work, uh, which is the work of justice for poor victims of, uh, of violence in the world, what I usually focus on is the story of the individuals and the clients that we served. I don't usually focus attention on my teammates. Uh, my mom always taught me that it was important not to brag. Um, and, and I do think that's true. And so I hope you don't hear any of that in, in the message today. Um, the other reason it's important to focus on the victims is, is that, that um, well, the people of God actually need to see them because it's often very difficult to see them. And we need to see the hope of rescue and restoration that is possible if we will show up in their lives. But today, I'm, I'm going to focus a little bit less on them and a bit more on what is possible for us, the body of Christ, if we're willing to follow Jesus into the work of justice in the world. What's, what's in it for us, you might say? And so to set the stage, what I want to do is, is let you get to know one of the people who embodies for me some of the beautiful possibilities for the people of God if we are willing to follow Jesus into the work of justice. And this is my good friend and IJM colleague, uh, Saju Matthew, uh, who I think will show up here. Saju's in the back. Uh, He's married to Anu. He has five kids, as do I. Um, His wife, Anu, is is hilarious. Um, For some reason, she calls him Boo Boo Kitty. And uh, and so I do too, uh, as often as I possibly can. Uh, Before joining me at headquarters, his office is right next to to me right now. Uh, Before joining me at headquarters, he, he worked in India for many years, leading our efforts to end slavery in India. And so this morning, I want to take you into one of the the many rescue operations that he led there where victims' lives were on the line and the the lives of himself and his team were on the line. One of these operations that actually illustrates for me the beautiful possibilities of of transformation for the people of God as we move in this work. So it's November 2009, early morning. Saju and his team set out to mobilize the government, uh, law enforcement in India, to rescue Krishnaya and Kaniyama and 24 other people, all from the untouchable class you may have heard of, who've been trapped in a, as slaves in a rice mill for the last 15 years. Now, in India, slave owners enforce their dominion over their slaves by just gratuitous violence, threats, intimidation. And this rice mill was no different. 
influential owners of these facilities uh, will pay thugs and even the police, who actually fashion themselves as thugs in these instances, to track down slaves who escape and then bring them back and beat them in front of the rest of the slaves so everybody gets the message. And then what they also do is if, if one of their brethren is in trouble, uh, if the government is coming, they will quickly uh, rally a frothing mob to come put a stop to the intervention. And so the owners have become a, a law unto themselves. Now, it, in fairness, while we are finding an increasingly willing uh, and proactive government in this fight against slavery in India, on this day, on this rescue operation, Saju confronts one of the most incompetent, inept, apathetic officials um, we've ever seen. We have gift-wrapped the case for them, but it is only after much advocacy and conjoling of, a, of the lead official, this man named, uh, uh, the official called a Tasseldar, that they agree to go. Now, on the way to the mill, Saju gets a call from one of our investigators who's on surveillance around the perimeter that there appears to have been a tip-off, probably from the Tasseldar's office. The owner is now moving all of the laborers out before we can get there. And so upon arrival, we find no one. When the team arrives, the owner shows up and angrily denies that any families whatsoever have ever been working in his rice mill. This rice mill owner is also a high-ranking politician in the region, and the Tasseldar is clearly intimidated and eager to leave, which he does. Now, in a, a truly unlikely string of events, Saju's team of investigators actually manages to intercept these 26 victims and recover all of them. Saju and his team rush to the Tasseldar's office to tell him the good news. <laughs> And uh, he doesn't think it's good news. Uh, he's actually terrified. And uh, he says, actually, there's nothing I can do. You don't know these people. The owner, they are dangerous. They will murder you, and they will not leave any evidence. And so the paralysis and apathy from the government over the next 12 hours is staggering. Despite clear evidence against the owner, the Tasseldar and his boss, uh, another official called an RDO, refused to take action. But Saju and his team refused to go away. They actually sleep overnight with the victims in this dusty government office. Saju then the next day goes to the media when the officials don't show up for work, hoping it will go away. But the media circus at the office forces the RDO and the Tasseldar to come to work. The day uh, goes on and on, but as night is falling on the second day, the RDO, in a totally cynical move, orders the victims to go with the Tasseldar and a few police back to this uh, oppressive rice mill to see if they can identify any of their personal belongings. The laborers are scared to death. They beg him not to be sent back. We plead with the RDO not to do it because it's both totally inappropriate under the law and because it's unsafe. Saju has no confidence in the willingness of the police or the Tasseldar to protect the victims or his team if things go badly. But he's convinced that it will go really badly for the victims if he and his team are not there. So what he decides is that he and two of his staff, a, a woman named Alice and another woman named Pranitha, will follow in the rice, uh, follow the victims back in a in a separate car. The victims are transported in a mini bus that we've actually rented that day. Saju then directs a second car, a surveillance car, to follow behind to stay outside to keep an eye on things out from outside the mill. When they arrive at the mill. It's about 7 p.m., completely dark on the second day. It's lightly raining. It's 36 hours from the time they set out the previous day. When they get there, at first the scene is quiet. No one's there. But then as soon as they're all the way inside, a mob starts to form. First 25 men, then 50, then 75, and growing. Members of the mob use their vehicles to him and all of the vehicles to prevent anybody from leaving. 
And then Saju tells, tells the Tosseldar, you've got to get these people out of here. But he ignores him. The mob of men are now riled up and they start coming for the victims in the minibus. Now what you need to understand is at this point, the, the mob doesn't care about Saju or his team. They want the victims. Who knows what they've been told? But it's not going to end well for the victims. And the Tosseldar is just going to roll with the punches, quite literally. And you know, Saju and his team could have done the same thing. I mean, they had fought so hard. Uh, they had fought so long. Who would blame them? But then Pranitha, who's like five feet tall and 90 pounds, literally, uh, she jumps into the minibus with the laborers to comfort them. And then Saju walks to the door of the bus and puts himself between the victims and this frothing, bloodthirsty mob. Alice continues to advocate uh, that they get out of there, but the Tosseldar does nothing. And now the mob surrounds the bus and is pounding on the side, demanding that the door be open. And now they do care about Saju. And they start shoving him backward. And with every moment that the authorities allow this thing to escalate, the mob gets, gets more emboldened. This is the way mobs work. Now, there are a, a number of potential responses to this sort of situation. It turns out most of them are unhelpful. Um, and the truth is, is that our natural inclination uh, is toward the unhelpful ones, especially if we're exhausted and afraid and we've been subjected for the last, say, 36 hours to uh, insults and disrespect. And I don't know about you, but in moments like these, um, I am strongly, strongly inclined toward hubris and bravado. In my weakness, I see if, if I see that I've lost control and that I'm going down, well, I'm pretty angry about it, to be sure. And there's a part of me that just wants to go down guns blazing, so to speak. And, but what the worst part about this is I lose focus on those I came to serve. I'm going to inflict as much pain on you as I possibly can, which, to be fair, is not much. And I'm not saying that this is what I want to be or should be, but that's just all too often what I am in, in sort of the crucible. And so that's why... I share this story. That's why I'm so overwhelmed by the picture of strength and steadiness that we witnessed in Saju on that day. You see, he was fully engaged. He never withdrew his loving, incarnating intercession for the victims. I mean, literal, physical, incarnating intercession for these victims. But he also did so without any of the unhelpful bravado uh, sort of the provocative, selfish uh, bravado that would have uh, accelerated the explosion of violence on these victims. He remained between the victims and the attackers, but he also remained silent with his arms raised as they came toward him and were shoving him to signal that he meant no aggression. It, was, it looked like it was going to end badly to him, but he knew that if he was provocative, it, the end would be swift and sure. He remembered who he was and who was with him. And because he did, he left hope for God to deliver all of them. When the surveillance team saw the mob gathering, they feverishly began calling every senior official they had on their speed dial. And eventually they got hold of two senior level officials to help. One called the Tosseldar, one called the police, and they said nothing should happen to those victims, nothing should happen to IJM, you restore order right now. And they did. And within minutes, Saju and the team drove out of that mill with 26 victims of slavery, relieved and shaken. They got them out of slavery. They helped them rebuild their lives. 26 God-breathed souls finally free and restored to dignity. Who would be still wasting away in that, in that brothel or in that rice mill if not for the courage and steadiness 
of Saju and his team, which I just find to be truly stunning. Yes, stunning. The rescue of these dear people, but equally stunning to me is the picture of Jesus that Saju has become for me and also for these people that he rescued. And so the question that I want to look at this morning is, how does that happen, that, that thing in Saju? Is he just uniquely gifted, or is there some other explanation for the strength and steadiness? And more relevant, is it possible for me to become more of that in my inner man? Now, we know from the scriptures that the answer to that last question is obviously yes. This is the familiar work of sanctification uh, or spiritual formation in which we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. But what might be less familiar to us is the role that the work of justice, the discipline of engaging, of engaging in the work of justice, can play in forming our inner man. Have you guys seen Saving Private Ryan? Yeah. So, it's a fictional story, but it's based in World War II. Captain uh, Miller, played by Tom Hanks, has just survived D-Day, the D-Day invasion, and then he's asked to go on a special mission uh, to assemble a team to go find Private James Francis Ryan, whose three brothers have already been killed in combat. He's the last one of the sons, and the War Department doesn't want to send a fourth letter home to Mama. So Captain Miller gets a battle-hardened team to go deep in the German-held territory where Ryan's believed to be, but he also takes this guy, Corporal Upham, who is just a translator, uh, who speaks uh, French and German. Never been in combat, never fired a gun. They eventually find Ryan, and when they do, he's with a small group of under-equipped soldiers who are trying to hold some bridges until uh, reinforcements can come. Miller and the team agree to help them do that before extracting Ryan. Translator Upham is attached to hardened soldier Private Mellish, there with a the cigarette hanging out of his mouth. His job, uh, Upham's job is going to be to just run the limited ammunition back and forth to where it needs to be. It's, first, it starts out good for the Americans, but then it start, begins to go badly. The combat action gets closer, and we see Mellish end up in hand-to-hand -hand combat, no guns, just a, a knife and fist in the second floor of a blown-out building. And Cor Corporal Upham, with rifle in hand and ammunition wrapped around his neck, can hear it. He's just downstairs. He knows it's not going well. He can hear Mellish pinned on the ground with a knife to his chest, begging for his life. And all Upham has to do is go upstairs. He's got a gun. The Nazi soldier does not. But he just can't muster the courage to go upstairs. Even as he listens to his friends succumbing to the strength of the Nazi soldier, he just won't go upstairs. Paralyzed in fear, he listens as his friend is stabbed to death and gasps his last breath. And then the German soldier walks down the stairs, looks up him in the eye, and just keeps on walking. I've watched that scene a lot of times. It's deeply moving. It provokes in me both contempt and sympathy for Upham. There's the part of me that just wants to say, you coward. You coward. But then at the same time, I feel the sense of his paralyzing fear, and I wonder, would I have what it takes in that moment? Upham knew what he should do. He had more than enough firepower, but in the moment when his friend needed him most, he didn't have what it took. He didn't have the strength and steadiness of his inner man to do it. And the reason he didn't is because he'd never seen this kind of trouble. At least that's one reason. He'd never been in combat, nor he'd been, had he been through the intensive field training that transforms an ordinary citizen into a warrior ready for the stress and brutality of combat. He had an, an intellectual interest in the life of soldiers, to be sure. He was writing a book about it. Um, but anyone who has served in combat, combat forces will tell you that, that that kind of training is essential. It turns out that Jesus saw the preparation of his team for his mission much the same way. Can we, and can we be clear? Like The mission that he's given us on earth is ridiculously awesome. 
The redemption of the whole world and the recovery and renewal of, of all that is lost and broken? And can we also agree that the part he has asked us to play is also awesome? If not a little bit crazy. As a matter of primary strategy, he, want, he plans to let the world see and hear and experience his trans transforming love through people like you and me. You kind of want to say, you know, Jesus, nice plan and all, but have you noticed what we're like? You know, how does he think this is going to work? What was his plan to make it work, to get the team ready when he, when he came to earth? Well, clearly he spent lots of time teaching the disciples the values of the kingdom and how it advances. Save your life and you'll lose it. Lose your life for my sake and you'll find it. The Sermon on the Mount where he said, you've heard it said, but I tell you. Parables, the kingdom of God is like this or like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the, all of this teaching is easy enough to see in the scriptures, but what is, uh, and, and actually that's what we're most drawn to, I think, in the Western church, is that teaching in terms of equipping the people of God to go out. But there's something else that he did that's easier to miss, and that is that Jesus also trained and equipped his disciples by leading them into trouble again and again. To the sick, to the homeless, to the prostitute, to the temple full of money changers, uh, to the dead and dying, to the uh, public where desperate crowds just pressed against him and the religious leaders were scheming uh, and plotting their death. He led them into the storm on the sea intentionally and then to the storm on the hill where he was murdered. And in the midst of all of this high-stress action, the cracks in the disciples' character began to come out again and again. Jesus was taking them beyond the safe confines of mere assent and worldview to the frontiers of trust and dependence. They were scared. They were anxious. They failed again and again to be what they should be. You know, you children, get out of here. Tell the crowds to go away. We don't have enough food. Who's going to be the first in the kingdom? Jesus, wake up. Don't you care that we're dying? And then they totally abandoned him when he needed him most. But this is the way that Jesus was building his body, a body that would proclaim and show the transforming love of God to every corner of the earth. He restored and mentored them, and he kept asking them to come back with him into the mission, into the trouble, to the hard and broken places for the sake of the mission and to equip them for the mission. And we see that the disciples, however flawed they remained, over time they were transformed, really transformed. It's homework, okay? Go take a look at the Gospels, for, uh, sort of the end of, well, just look at the Gospels in the disciples' lives from, in the Gospels through sort of the beginning of Acts, like 3 and 4. You see Peter in that. It, his transformation is totally profound. From terror and fear that produced erratic violence and betrayal on the night of Jesus' arrest to standing and delivering one of the greatest sermons that's ever been given under looming threat of arrest and execution. And thousands were saved. The oppressive, oppressive leader's hand was stayed. The gospel and the kingdom advanced. Peter had become a picture of strength and steadiness fit for the mission. Jesus' invitation to the mission and his plan for making us fit is the same today. His training, yes, it does include the essential disciplines like teaching and worship and solitude and prayer and fasting. But he also invites us to follow him into trouble. This is where the mission is, and this is how we allow him to build in us the capacity for sacrificial and courageous love that is essential to the mission. We've found this to be true for developing the sort of leaders like Saju that we need to lead our mission. And God has used Saju's long familiarity with trouble to equip him, he would tell you, for this hard struggle. Saju was Ivy League educated at the University of Pennsylvania. He became a very accomplished lawyer in the United States, but his beginnings are a long way from the Ivy Leagues and, uh, and from 
uh, quiet corridors of American courts. Saji was born to Christian parents in a mud hut in Bhopal, India. His mom eventually moved to uh, become a nurse to Philadelphia. He was separated from his mom for two years. Eventually, she saved enough money to bring dad and kids to Philly, but all they could afford was inner-city apartment in one of the roughest neighborhoods in Philly. So over the next several years, Saju actually had to navigate the immense violence of this neighborhood. He loved to play basketball and other games in the street, but when he did, the bullies and the gangs would come. And he learned that there were times to run, times to de-escalate, and times to show that you're willing to fight back. He told me not too long ago about getting backed into a corner, literally, with his friends, with some of the rougher dudes in his neighborhood. They had nowhere to go. Saju looks down, and all he sees, he sees a, a bottle, a glass bottle on the ground. He picks it up, and he breaks part of it off to form a glass knife. And he shows them that he's willing to use it, and the bullies backed off. And as Saju sort of said to me offhandedly, he goes, you know, sometimes the bullies just need to see a little resolve on the other side of the equation to back down. God built this sort of resolve in Saju in his family's hard scrabble years in Bhopal and in Philly's, Philly's inner cities. He continued to refine that in the dozens of rescue operations into which he's followed Jesus. And that is the sort of resolve that it's going to take and, and that will end slavery in India. And I would just encourage you that that is a day that is certain. Saju knows it, his team knows it, and they rejoice at every indication that it's coming true. He told me recently about going back to this same Tosseldar and RDO with another case. And he said, this time, the Tosseldar and RDO, they did not fight us. Instead, they properly conducted the rescue operation, bringing 70 people trapped in a brick kiln to freedom. Everywhere IJAM has fought slavery, he says, in India. This is the same story. First, great resistance and pushback, but in time, rule of law is established. People are protected. Crime is deterred. I am convinced that the work of justice is God's work of bringing light into the dark places where horrific evil is perpetrated. God's redemptive work in the world is restoring the shalom that was broken by sin. This I have seen with my own eyes. And that brings me back around in closing to where we started this morning. What's possible for the church in this work of justice? Yeah, it draws us into Jesus' mission. It is the mission, and he uses it to equip us. But there's so much more. There's so much more. I wish you could be party to the emails and the conversations and celebrations that I have with my colleagues who are in the thick of the struggle for justice in these broken places. We're talking about uncommon, authentic energy, the joy and the peace of the kingdom. My colleagues in Kenya are literally slapping high fives with police when unjust communities mock and insult and, ins and spit at them because they feel honored to be sharing in the sufferings of Christ for the least of these. I thought that was only for the Apostle Paul. Staff in Uganda are comforting their mothers in the face of death threats and false criminal allegations from the perpetrators of violence. I know, Mom, but isn't this the life that God wants for his children? They are experiencing nothing less than the overflowing, joyful presence of God in a front row to the kingdom of God advancing on earth. Heaven come down. Just like he promised in Isaiah 58, if we join him in pouring ourselves out in love for our neighbor. Invitation. Promise. To be called repairer of broken walls. Restorer of streets with dwellings. Thanks be to God. I have an ask for you. One, will you ask God to bring you more and more into the hope and joy of the work of justice on earth? Just begin to ask him. 
It is an invitation and the promise of his presence will not fail. And then the other thing I would ask you to do is um, we have these back there. we just love for you to fill this out. This is an invitation to become a prayer partner of ours, just to join us in the work of prayer. And if you are a prayer partner with us, you'll be a party to some of the stories that come from the field and the great need. But what it will also do is give you a window into the great hope of transformation um, and allow you to participate in it uh, with us because we need hope in this broken in this broken world. And the other thing I would encourage you to do is, this is not an invitation to go to India, though maybe that is the invitation, but this is an invitation in your own backyard to explore where is the trouble, where is the mission, and where God is, is leading me. Thank you very much.